designed and manufactured in the UK by Canon Audio Limited. Wait, Canon the camera company? That's right. This isn't clickbait. Let's begin. Hey everyone, I bet most people watching this had no idea that Canon, the company that's best known for their photo and video products, also made audio equipment. Neither did I until just recently when I stumbled across these beauties, the Canon S30s. When I say Canon made audio equipment, I mean that they used to when Canon Audio Limited was founded in the mid-1980s. More about that in a bit. First, let me tell you more about this specific set of speakers. When I first got these, they were pretty scuffed up and in desperate need of some TLC, but luckily the drivers were in great condition and there were no cracks in the enclosures. Let's take a closer look as I take them apart for some light restoration and in the process uncover some interesting details about this very quirky speaker from Canon's forgotten past. But before I do that, a quick sound test. And they sound awesome. The speakers are constructed out of two injection molded ABS shells, as well as this reflective front slipper piece. With just three screws, two in the back and one in the front, and the front shiny part, which is called an acoustic mirror, is off. And now that the rest of the screws are out, we can easily pull the two shells apart carefully disconnecting the electronics. This PCB with some rather large capacitors and inductors presumably serves as an equalizer meant to tune the frequency response of the driver. I will carefully set it aside for now. Luckily no adhesives were used in the construction of this speaker, which was a relief. Around the perimeter of the rear shell is a rubber gasket, inside serving as a structural brace and tying all components together is this hefty aluminum die cast frame. There's also quite a bit of this acoustic polyester fiber fill taking up majority of the space. Removing the fiber fill reveals the driver, which is held in place with four screws through the shell and into the die cast brace. Removing the driver is a bit tricky since the frame and the driver have to come out at the same time. And there it is. It's a pretty hefty four inch driver with a parasitic tweeter. Now that I've got the speakers disassembled, I will attempt to lightly restore them, hoping to get most of the scuffs out and polish the shiny piece, but I won't bore you with that, I'll just show you the final result. And here's how that turned out. A bit of history about the S30s and Canon's endeavor into the audio space. The Canon S30s were released sometime in 1994, retailing for about 170 USD or approximately 320 in today's money, making this an entry-level hi-fi speaker and a smaller more affordable counterpart to their original S50s and S70 models. As I mentioned earlier in the teardown, they have a single down-firing driver encased in an injection molded ABS enclosure. But what's with the unusual form factor? Well, at the outset of Canon Audio Division, there was an idea dubbed Wide Imaging Stereo, or WIS. This was an ambition to achieve a wider stage by firing the sound at an acoustic mirror, this glossy part at the base of the speaker. This method was used in effort to create a wider horizontal dispersion, and to some degree, they've managed to achieve this. These speakers have a surprisingly wide sound stage. They sound very pleasant, and some songs have a surreal live feel to them. For example, Nightingale by Nora Jones and Hotel California by the Eagles 
really sound like they're being performed live in front of you. Hip hop is handled quite well too. The S30's bass frequency response is more than adequate for most tracks. My main complaint with the way they sound is with mids. There seems to be some smearing in the mid frequencies, especially in more complex tracks with more instruments playing at the same time. I wasn't able to find the official frequency response for these speakers, but there's a review on hi-fi-classic.net of the S35s, which were a slightly upgraded model, mentioned a frequency response of 70 Hz to 22 kHz plus or minus 3 decibels, which sounds about right to my ear. They reach well into the lower frequencies with no distortion, and highs are not harsh but also not the most resolving due to the nature of that parasitic tweeter design. Overall they make for a really nice entry level speaker that is very enjoyable for extended listening. I paired them with this $80 amp from Amazon and when I first plugged them in I just meant to quickly test to make sure they work but instead ended up listening for well over half an hour. The wide sound stage really drew me in. I would describe the overall listening experience as pleasant and the quirky form factor only adds to the charm. If you're interested in learning more about Canon's weird experiment, I strongly recommend this great 5 part blog, which I will link below, where I was able to learn all the fun facts about Canon and its venture into audio. The article is written by Phil Ward, who worked at Canon Audio in a design and engineering role from 1990 to the closure of the company in 1996, and was a design manager from around 1994 onward. In its short time, Canon Audio released several different speakers with varying commercial success, including some for retail spaces as well as some smaller desktop computer sets. By the end of 96, Canon Audio Limited closed its doors. It seems to me Canon had something truly unique and special on their hands with this wide imaging stereo idea, but unfortunately for whatever reason, it didn't take off. Perhaps someday they'll give it another go. And just like Canon's audio days, this video has come to an end. I hope you found it entertaining and informative. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.